All right, thank you, Megan. Okay, let's take our Bibles and um, turn to Acts chapter 8, please. Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. And so before we start, um, just, you know, tonight is... We dedicate to thanking the Lord, especially for our salvation, um, but just thought maybe it'd be good if we just opened the, open the uh, uh, service with praise and thanksgiving uh, tonight. Uh, you know, uh, something I shared with you a little while back was Psalm chapter, uh, don't turn there, Psalm chapter 107, verse 22. It's let, it says, let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. So to give a thanksgiving, sac thanksgiving is a sacrifice, at least verbally. Uh, you, can, you can be thankful in a lot of ways. You can, you know, normally we understand uh, Thanksgiving, we buy somebody a gift. You know, we express we want to let them know when we're thankful. Um, but at the very least, for God, I mean, you could certainly give a gift. You could give, you know, you could give, put something extra in missions if you were just thankful and want to do something for God. Uh, but you can also say something. Just, just say why you're thankful. In Psalm chapter 116, verse 17, it says, I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. And that's great. And, you know, uh, I'd like for us to just learn to be in that habit of, of just being thankful and ready to be thankful to the Lord privately you know, if you do it a lot privately, it'd be much easier to do it publicly. Uh, but it's something you work at. You know, you have to be thankful on purpose. It doesn't come automatic. Um, so do we have any offerings tonight? Anybody? Yes, Brother Miller. Amen. So Amen. Yeah. 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 You know, if you look through history, a lot of a lot of things have happened through history, and uh, a lot of bad things, and big, big, huge things, and bad things, and. Devastations, and but you know the world just goes on. Just we're here today, and you know, uh, Brother Miller is, is you know as you think about that, um, I think it's helped us to be thankful for things that maybe we took for granted. Um, but uh, God's been good, very good. Amen. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Amen. It's like he, it's like he's in charge, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> Amen. I mean, it's easy to know it, but to to trust them while you're going through it. But then to look back and, and just, uh, it's so obvious now, but, 
but then it wasn't. Amen. Amen. Good. Anybody else? All right. Yes. Amen. Amen. Good. Anybody else? Amen. Brother Tim. I mean, amazing things, just amazing. When you hear the stories, maybe we'll hear one tonight, but just how God has just been working and just bringing them in. Amen. Just, amen. Yes, ma'am, Miss Katie. Amen. Amen. That's good. Yes, sir. Amen. And that's a lot of support. No. Amen. Amen. That's good. Amen. Good. Okay. Um, Acts chapter 8. I'd just like to just... We're just going to read some scriptures and just think about the two two ordinances uh, that God has given us. And one is baptism, and the other is uh, the Lord's Supper, which we will observe tonight. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of things we could talk about about them. But, um, you know, just I just wrote it really as a church family. I think most of us understand them and what it's about. Now, some confusion, of course, is uh, that both or one or the other is a, a part of our salvation, which we understand that neither one are a part of our salvation as far as bringing us closer to God and forgiveness of sin. Uh, baptism doesn't forgive our sins, and, and the Lord's Supper does not forgive our sins. It has nothing to do with that. Uh, the baptism is after you're saved, and only after you're saved. That's why we don't baptize babies. Uh, that's why we don't baptize uh, for somebody else. I mean, a pers- each person has to be baptized, baptized of their own accord and their own obedience and uh, for God. Um, but you have to be saved to be baptized. And uh, so when you are... Uh, Baptize. Well, I'll read some verses. So let's just look at a couple places, uh, maybe where we see baptism and and kind of what happened there. And uh, and like I said, I just want to be reminded tonight because tonight, um, you know, sometimes we do different things. And since the Lord allowed us to baptize last Sunday, um, you know, some folks that are really excited about being saved and and um, it's just great. Praise the Lord. Uh, but that's what the church does uh, in obedience to the Lord. In uh, Acts chapter 8 and verse 12, uh, you know, we tell you the story of Philip. We don't go through it a lot. But Philip was a preacher. I don't know if he was a great preacher, but God was using him in a great way. And people were being saved, and there was a great revival going on. Um, and verse 12 is just one verse of many in Acts chapter 8. But it says, when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom, kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they what? They were baptized, both men 
and women. So here's Philip preaching, and he's preaching, and there's all kinds of people, and they're getting saved, and they're having a great revival. Well, to me, uh, when you're having great revival, it's like this is the spot. This is where I need to be, and, and great revival is going on. Well, and so when we get to verse 26, where we normally pick up, you know, we just kind of picture Philip out there wandering around and, you know, and God taps Philip on the uh, shoulder and says, hey, Philip, since you're not doing nothing, I, want, I got a job for you. It wasn't like that. Philip was busy. Philip was serving the Lord. Philip was in the Lord's work and being used by God and people. Now, you, you think about this, scores, and, and, and we don't know how many, but lots of people are being saved. And God says to Philip, just the oddest thing, he says, uh, I want you to leave all that and go talk to one guy. Isn't that fantastic? This shows that God says, hey, listen, even though it's happening over here, heart's tender, and, and I'm allowed to work there, man, it's great. But I care about every soul. And if somebody's looking and somebody's open, um, we're on it. And so he has Philip go over and talk to, leave everybody else, leave the revival, and go talk to that one guy. Isn't that great? Like that one day you were that one guy or you were that one lady. And um, so that's what happens. So when we get to verse 26, it says, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Okay, time to go. What? I mean, we're just in our third week of revival, and it's, it's happening, Lord. Um, time to go. That'd be a hard thing. Wouldn't it? Just, it's hard to know that, okay? Um, Arise, go toward the south. And there's another negative. Right, brother? Tim? Go toward the south and leave the north and go to the south. And like, man, north is where it's at, you know. It's... And uh, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem to Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man, this, a man of uh, Ethiopia, uh, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians who had the charge of all her treasures and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. So he was, I was talking to somebody today and they said, you know, we've been looking and searching and trying and, you know, to, to, to find the truth. And that's what this guy was doing. He, he's already gone. He's finished up his trip and he's headed back home now. Maybe a little discouraged, maybe a little... He knows he still doesn't have it. And you know when you have it. Um, and he just knew it was, that's why he's still reading his Bible, he's still searching, he's probably reading something they, they gave him or, you know, but here he is reading the scriptures um, while he was uh, uh, returning from Jerusalem. Verse 28, he was returning and sitting in his chariot uh, read Isaiah the prophet. And the spirit of the Lord said unto Philip, go now and join thyself into this chariot. So he runs up to the chariot and, and um, complete stranger, complete stranger. It would be sort of like if God told you at a gas station, hey, go talk to the guy at the next pump. And you say, I don't know that guy. Well, sometimes the Lord has you talk to people you don't know. Amen. Amen. Matter of fact, sometimes they're great prospects you don't know. And uh, so here's Philip. And so he's, he's kind of like, it's kind of obvious. I mean, they're out in the desert. This guy's in his chariot by himself. Philip is by himself. So you know he saw him running up to the chariot. And this guy, so Philip's thinking, this guy thinks I'm going to rob him. 
or this guy thinks I'm going to beg, or this guy. You know, you know how you have all these things of what thing, things in your mind of what the other guy's thinking as you're walking up to him. Have any of y'all ever done that, or is it just me? He's thinking this, he's thinking this, and he's thinking this, and and um, and so Philip ran up to him, and uh, and he heard him reading. So the guy was reading out loud, and said, "Understandest what thou readest." He understand what you read in the Bible, and his answer was like all lost people, which is, I don't understand all the these and the vowels, and it doesn't make any sense to me. I don't, you know. And he said, verse thirty-one, he said, "How can I accept some man should guide me?" And Philip said, "Oh, you didn't think I was going to rob you? You didn't think I was going to try to beg money or beg food or ask for a ride in your chariot or?" You know, all those things he was thinking, you no. Know, he said, man, I just wish I had somebody show me what this meant. Amen. And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. And so Philip climbs in the chariot and sits with him. And he says, he said, let's, 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 let's open this together. And he opened that scroll. And just so happens that the very place he's reading in the Old Testament, 700 years before Jesus came, was written. Just so happens that this, this guy's reading this very verse. He says, well, here's where I left off, right here. And the place of the scripture which he read was this. And so he, you think about this. He said, no. Here's what I'm reading. I just don't understand it, Mr. Mr. Preacher Philip. He was led as a, sle- a sheep to the slaughter. And like a, like a lamb dumb before his shearers, he, so he opened not his mouth. Now, when he read that verse, what do you think Philip is thinking? Let's put our place in Philip's shoes. What's Philip thinking right now when he just read that verse? He's thinking, well, our Lord just went before Pilate. Our Lord said to Pilate, he says, don't you have anything to say? Aren't you going to defend yourself? And, and Jesus opened not his mouth. Jesus could have said a lot. But he wasn't there to defend himself. He was there to become guilty. Now, if Jesus were to defend himself, he could have been defended. But he wasn't there to do that. He was there to become guilty for you and for me, to take our guilt and have our guilt placed upon him. So that was the verse he read. And uh, it says in verse 33, in his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. In other words, any, anything that he, the sinless son of God deserved, he didn't get. He got what we deserve. Who shall declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth? Which is what? What's that mean? That's when he hung on the cross and he was crucified. He was murdered by the hands of sinful man and his life was taken away. Now, man's side... Life was taken away, but on his side, life was given. He gave it up. You know, if Jesus wanted to speak a word, remember what happened in the garden Amen. when the soldiers came after him? I am he. he said, I am he. And the whole army fell down backwards. Amen. He could have done that. But he didn't. Yeah, when he spoke his name, they fell down. The whole army Backward. I mean, just blew him down. 
So when, Pro, when, when, when Pilate said, don't you have anything to say? He says, you don't want me to do that. I got lots to say, but I'm not here for me. I'm here for you. He's here for the very one that was there and yelling at him. He was, he was there for the very, every stripe that the soldiers hit him with. And every, every piece of flesh that was torn away, it was torn away for the very one that was tearing it away. You get that. And that's us. That was our sin doing that to him. So, verse 34 says, And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speakest thou? Who's Isaiah talking about here? Who's, who's, this, who's Isaiah talking about this guy that was written about 700 years ago from when he's reading it? You understand it? This guy is the guy that Philip was just preaching about in that great revival. That's the guy. So you imagine Philip's getting pretty stirred right here in, in the chariot, saying, okay, I see what the Lord's doing now. It's... And he said, I pray thee, of whom speakest thou the prophet of himself or some other man? And Philip opened his mouth at that Old Testament scriptures written hundreds of years before this time and began at that same Old Testament scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And that was the Isaiah Road that we're talking about this morning. That's one part of it. He preached, he said, that is Jesus Christ. Maybe you've heard about him while you were in Jerusalem. Maybe you heard about him. and It just happened, folks. Yeah. Wow. And so he, exp- he went through and explained who Christ was. And so uh, verse 36, it says, As they went on their way, they came into a certain water. And the eunuch said, Well, see, here is water. What doth hinder me? To be baptized. And Philip said, let's go through it one more time. If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. He said, Mr. Eunuch, baptism is for the Christian. Baptism is for the person that places their faith and their trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection, which we just talked about, and that's who that's who it's for. Hmm. He said, Let me ask you a question. Do you believe that? And Philip said, verse 37, if thou believest with all thine heart. Thou mayest, if you if you truly trust in this, then that's all you need to do. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he said, Well, that's it. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up, come up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord called away Philip, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Now, I've seen a lot of nervous people get in the water, real nervous. I've seen people trembling and shaking. I've seen people put it off for years. They're so scared. A lot of scared people get in the water. But guess what? When they come out, they're always happy. Always happy. 
There's just something about obedience. You can't explain it. You can't. You can't convince, but you can just you can just know it when you when you do it when you obey God, and it's a good step. It's a good beginner step of a Christian walk is a walk of obedience. And and if there's ever been a step of obedience, it's baptism. Why do I gotta take my clothes off in front of everybody? Well, it's not exactly that. Okay, why do I got to put that stupid blue thing on? Well, why, why do I have to get all the way in the water? Why, why, why? You know, just because just it says so. And it's just something about it. When they come up out of the water, they're happy. They never say, why did I have to do that? Why did I? All of that's gone after, after obedience. So it's something you only do one time. Now, if you've been baptized several times, you haven't been baptized several times. You've only been baptized one time. The other times you just got wet. If you weren't saved... If you weren't, you know, you didn't get baptized because if you're not saved, you're not really baptized. Okay? If you've been baptized four times and you're still not saved, you're still not baptized. So if you say, well, I want to get saved again, but I don't want to have to get baptized again, you're not because you were baptized the first time. You just got wet. And kids baptizing each other in the bathtub doesn't count. Every kid here has probably been baptized 50 times by their brother or sister. That doesn't count either. Okay. It's a good start, but it doesn't count. Take your Bible, turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. With uh, Tim and Candace... You know that couple were sitting here, Bobby, I was saying that's like, it's true. I don't know if you notice, uh, Tim and Candace were sitting right about here this morning. And you prob I mean, uh, um, not Tim and Candace, um, John and, Sean and Stephanie were sitting there, but they looked like Tim and Candace. I mean, Stephanie looked just like her with the mask on. I mean, it's like sitting in the same spot. And you probably thought it was them, but those are new people. But that's salvation row right there. I just want you to know that's that's a good row. All right. Um, in Acts chapter two and verse, well, I said that to say this. In Acts chapter two, verse forty-one, it says, "Then they that gladly received his word, just like the eunuch, just like the people in Acts eight twelve did." Then they that gladly received his word, they understood it, they, they didn't reject God's word, they accepted it, they accepted Christ, they were baptized. And with that, the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. That's why we know how many people were added to the church, as many were baptized, which means what? When you get baptized, you become a church member. So I said to Tim and Candace, I I said all that, say this. I said, um, last week, I said, Wednesday. I said, do you know you're members of our church now? When you got baptized, you became members of the church. Because I've had people ask me, we probably should explain a little bit better. I didn't know when I got baptized, but uh, when you get baptized, you become a member of the church. That's the requirement. Um, We don't have special classes to become members. We don't have, we don't have, you know, to become a member of Patuxent Baptist Church. um, You need to be saved and baptized. Now, people have asked me, well, shouldn't there be a little bit more to it? Because what if this guy gets saved and he's he's a sinner and he's still a sinner? It's like, well, that's just kind of how we get him. We just get them right off the street, man, just sinners. 
And, and they said, well, shouldn't we clean them up before we make them a church member? Well, if I made them a church member, I might do that. But I don't make them church members. Amen. The Bible says, you know, the Bible doesn't say have class. I'm not against it if, if you want to have classes and like, okay, we need to help these people understand what they're getting into and that's fine if that's what the Lord leads a church to do. But in the Bible, they never did that. Amen. They got saved. They stopped the chariot. They went in the water. Amen. They, got, they were at Jerusalem preaching. And this really wasn't even the day of Pentecost. wasn't planned to be a revival. Those guys just stood up and started preaching. Amen. And people heard the gospel in their own language. And people were just getting saved everywhere. And then the church of Jerusalem just started baptizing right there. And so I kind of feel like that's what we ought to do. Just, you know, our job is to reach them and, and get them and reach them and, and, and go into all the world and, uh, and preach the gospel and baptize them. Then it says, what? Teaching them. Now, if you want to teach them, then baptize them. I mean, that's I'm not I'm not I'm not your enemy. You can do what you want to do. But when I say you, I don't mean you. Okay, I mean somebody else. Okay, if you're here, we're going to baptize them. Then we're going to teach them. And you say, well, isn't that backwards? Well, it might be. It, it, it seems like we should teach them. Like, okay, you know what you're getting into, right? <laughs> and then we understand why we don't teach them. Because if we taught them, they would never get baptized, right? But hey, listen, baptism is a great thing. Baptism, you know, when I got baptized, I, I didn't know. I didn't know anything. You know what I knew? I knew I was saved, and they said, this is what you need to do next. And I said, uh-huh. My first, that was my first day in church. First day was a, t- a Wednesday, because saved Tuesday, came to church Wednesday. I went forward. They said, you know, read the verses to me. I said, I'm already saved. I know I'm saved. And they said, okay, Mr. I don't know what they call me, but uh, Mr. Hippie Guy, okay, you need to get baptized. Uh-huh. <laughs> I didn't say yes, sir, back then. I said, uh-huh. So I said, uh-huh. So I went in the back, and they said, take all your clothes off. And I was like, okay, like a doctor's office, and put this blue thing on. I put the blue thing on, and I'm getting the water. I had no idea what, I, what they were doing. Got in the water. Got in the water. You can't tell me that 3,000 people knew what they were doing. They were just doing what they were told to do. The next thing you need to do is get baptized. And they said, in their own language, uh uh-huh. I'm in. That's all they did. There's no way. There's no way that eight guys or 18 guys could talk to 3,000 people and explain everything they're doing. They just got baptized. They just got baptized. So... You know, whether I like it or not, that's not the issue. I'm just, in my mind, if God said it that way, then we'll just do it that way. Take your Bible, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, just real quick. The Lord's Supper, now, that is required. You cannot be a church member without baptism. You can come here. We actually have a friends list. We have a friends list. If you get saved, you're not baptized, you're on a friends list, but you're not a church member. Now, you can get baptized in another church and come here and we'll, we'll just take your baptism because if you've obeyed the Lord in another church, then that's fine. But if you're not baptized, you're not a church member. So when you get baptized... You're a church member, and you only do it one time. You never get baptized again. You never get saved again, so you never, never get baptized again. Now, the Lord's Supper is different. This is for 
church members who are in this is a this is a picture of your fellowship with God which is ongoing this never ends this this goes forever until till we go with the Lord and I'm and um and Jesus said, you know, I'm not going to eat with you anymore until I, until I come back. Is it cold in here? Is, it turning, is air on? It's air? Okay, turn the air off. Right, guys? Do you love me again? Okay. Uh, turn the air off. Let's turn the air off. You like that? No air condition when it's snowing. Okay. Lord's Supper is ongoing. I think we're going to eat with the Lord in heaven. I, I believe we're just going to keep eating with the Lord and we'll keep remembering his goodness in heaven. Verse 23 says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread... And when he had given thanks, he break it and say, said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Now, this first time he said this was before he died. He said, now, we're going to do this, but from now on, it'll be after I do what we're remembering. Okay. See, just like you give a wedding ring before you get married, but it's for after you get married to remember that you got married. It's a reminder. It doesn't marry me, but Lord's Supper doesn't save you, but it reminds me, okay? Um, in verse 25, and after the same, same manner, he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament, in my blood. A testament is a covenant or a different, a little bit different uh, way of dealing with it. Now, before we were looking toward the blood. Now we're, now the blood's going to be shed. This do as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. So there's no time that we have to do it or need to do it, but he says, but whenever you do it, this is what I want you to remember, and this is how I want you to do it. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. So when we take the Lord's Supper, supper, we remember his death. Okay, that's one thing we do here. That's one thing you should do when you take the Lord's Supper is remember his death. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread... And drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. And so that's basically saying you, you know he died for you. You know he loves you. You know he shed his blood. He suffered for you. And so for you to just continue in sin is saying I don't care. I know you did, but I'm going to keep sin of my life, even though you paid for it, okay? Um, so, so the Bible says in verse 28, but let a man examine himself. So let him eat of that bread and drink that cup. And so here's the thing, it's wrong if you don't do it. If you say, well, I'm not going to take the Lord's Supper because, because I'm in sin. Well, that's not right because the Lord told us to take the Lord's Supper. Right? So if he tells us, he said, when, when you eat, this is what you do. Well, we're eating tonight. So this is what you do. So if you want to hang on to your sin, then you are sinning. If you say, I can't take the Lord's Supper, well, why can't you? Because I have sin. Well, okay, we're having a problem here. So, uh, so let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink that cup. That's why we want to just make sure things are right. Okay? Uh, for this cause, 
I'm sorry, uh, verse 29, for he that eateth and drinketh, un drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself. It doesn't mean you're going to go to hell, okay? The, the thought there is judgment, okay? Um, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak. He's talking about church members. Weak and sickly among you and many sleep. So in the church of Corinth, people were sick and dying and died because they disregarded the Lord's Supper. So it's not something we take lightly. Okay? Um, I can't say I know anybody that died because they did that. I don't know. That, I don't know. Maybe it's happened. Maybe it hasn't. Maybe I don't know if anybody here has ever got sick because they disregarded the Lord's Supper. But I don't know. But don't do this. You know, when we, we uh, uh, take the Lord's Supper and you say, oh, brother so-and-so shouldn't be taking it. And, and then he's sick. You don't know why he's sick. Right? Don't, don't do that. The Bible doesn't say let a man examine everybody else. Who's taking it? Who shouldn't be taking it? It doesn't say that. It says examine your own heart. And that's the only one you need to worry about, unless it's your kids. You can smack it out of their hand. <laughs> that's okay. If they shouldn't be, okay? But anyway. Um, it's for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Or for Christians, that's they died. For if we judge ourselves, we shall not be judged of God. That's what it's talking about. In other words, the only reason that God will, will mess with you, judge you, chastise you, is because you're not listening to him. But if we take care of it, God says, great. I don't want to do it anyway. We judge ourselves, we shall not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. God just wants to bring us back. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come out together to eat, tarry one for another. And I did want to say this. We can do a lot of stuff online. We can give online. We can watch services online. We can... But we can't take the Lord's Supper online. I don't know. I don't know any way around that. It says, "When ye come together, we have to be together to do this." Um, so I count it a great privilege that we can be together and do this. Um, so you know, I just pray that we can all be together one day. But this is this is how we have to do it. I can't. You know, I can't go to your house and all. We don't do it separately. That's not how God, he said, when you come together. We have to be together. Tarry one for another. In other words, we do it together, together, at the same time. If any man hunger, uh, let him eat at home, that you come not together unto condemnation. You know, I didn't read these parts, but they were abuse, actually abusing the Lord's Supper. And they were making it a big party, and it's not a big party. It's a sober time, a sobering time. So uh, why don't you just uh, prepare your hearts. Uh, let's have the trustees come. And uh, Brother Lewis. Um, just let's all come and just prepare your heart. Brother Chris, can you help us tonight? Well, just come on. We're, we're all coming back, man. So, um, let's just remember our salvation. Let's remember our baptism. I mean, that's when it all started. I mean, for 
us to be part of the church, to get in, and then, then, so, you know, baptism reminds us of the, of the beginning, our salvation. Praise God, and it happened, we're in, part of the church. The Lord's Supper reminds us of the continuation of what God's doing and what he wants to do. He didn't say this is the third Lord's Supper and we're done. He says, listen, you're going to keep doing this till I come back. So in other words, as long as you're here, you take the Lord's Supper. And when you take it today, you look forward to the next one. Because God's never changed. Amen. So let's, uh, let's just thank the Lord where we are. And uh, we'll prepare to pass out the elements.